Fruit of the Spirit, y'all catch uh, the list of what they were naming there, uh, and that's what we ought to be. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. While you're turning there, I was thinking this morning uh, when I got the news uh, uh, with the Bonds family as the grandfather passing away, first thing that crossed my mind is none of us are promised tomorrow. Not a one of us. And I praise the Lord. The Lord gave him a, a good lot, long life. And yet um, none of us are promised a good long life. Um, I have said many times, uh, caskets come into all sizes. And unfortunately, I've had uh, the responsibility of putting some small caskets in the ground. And so it's important for us to realize that we need to be ready to meet the Lord on any day. And the first step of that being ready is to make sure that we stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 
that we have trusted the only thing that can give us the forgiveness of our sins and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Um, Wednesday night, I believe it was, I mentioned <clears throat> there is there's one God. There's one heaven. There's one plan for man to get to heaven. And it's by one mediator. And that mediator is only the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way that we can get there. And by by knowing that we are sinners, and as David was saying in Sunday school this morning, we stand condemned already because of our sin problem. All of us have sinned and come short of the glorious standard of God. But thank the Lord that he loved us enough to send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who did not know any sin, never committed sin, that he may be the one eligible to take my place and to die there for my sin, for the wages of sin is death. And by him dying for me, that he could offer the forgiveness of my sin, the removal of my sin. And because he was righteous and took my place, he extends to me his righteousness. So when God the Father looks at Randy Blackwell, he doesn't see a sinner. He doesn't even see just a good man because there is none that are good but he sees the righteousness of his son Jesus Christ that's what he sees and that's the only reason I'm worthy to go to God's heaven not for anything that I've done but only for what he accomplished and that is going to be the true story for every one of us uh, in our lives. Either we have made the choice to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and we stand redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ or we have neglected to make that choice or we have muddied the waters by saying, well, I've trusted Christ and I'm trying to do the best I can. I've trusted Christ and I've been baptized. I've trusted Christ and uh, I go to church and I'm a member. I've trusted Christ and I've done all of these other things. Anytime that we try to put all everything else with Christ, we are neglecting Christ. It's Christ alone right. is what saves us. And that's what I encourage you to make sure of before the day comes for all of us have an appointment with death. It's appointed to man once to die. And after that, the judgment. And we need to be ready. 1 Timothy 5. <clears throat> and we're in our book study of 1 Timothy. Last Sunday, we started with chapter 5, verses 17 through the end of the chapter. Uh, the title there, The Treatment of Elders. Elders being pastors. Uh, we have, we have hand, uh, uh, explained that enough. Uh, part one that we saw last week was honoring uh, your pastors, uh, respect and remuneration uh, given to those who rule well and to those who labor in the word of God and in doctrine, the teachings. I want to thank you again for your uh, care of me and my family. And, and also, I want to thank you for last Sunday's recognition of our 31st anniversary here as your pastor. Uh, it's hard to believe that 31 years have gone by so fast uh, here uh, being in Holly Hills Baptist. Um, just a little clarification there in case any, anybody else misunderstands. It was not our wedding anniversary that we were talking about. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I do have some children, uh, 41 and 42 years old. <laughs> our an wedding anniversary comes in May and it'll be the 45th anniversary uh, uh, coming up. But uh, praise the Lord for the 31 years that we've been here, and it's been a joy, and the Lord has uh, seen us through step by step, and we thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for you, and appreciate you. But tonight, um, excuse me, today we want to look uh, here at part two, and it deals with the protecting, the rebuking, and the selecting of elders in verses 19 through 25. Father, I pray that as we pause here, 
and look into your word that you may guide us into understanding not only the truth of what it says, but Lord, in light of that truth, how should we live? What type of believers should we be? How should we uh, understand the importance of your church and, and having the right man as the pastor of the church? Lord, I pray that in all cases you may give us that understanding and the preparation of our heart and minds uh, today. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit and your word. And may you use both in us this morning. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. <clears throat> there are always people eager to false, falsely accuse a pastor, a man of God, and uh, that's a scary thought. Uh, we hear it all the time. I've, I've heard just in the last two weeks, another man, godly man, a, a pastor of a church, a large church, um, done many years of ministry, um, accusations that have been made. Now, the first things that come to my mind are, are those accusations true? Could it be that this man, while doing all of these good things, had been behind the scenes doing some things that he should not have? And these were not all sexual type of allegations. Some of it was dealing with monies, mishandling, and, and other things that could be there. I mean, there are a lot of things that can be made of accusations. But um, the point is, here is another man that is being scrutinized and investigated. Here is another cause that the devil can use to slander the church. Another way that Jesus Christ can be evil spoken of. Um, then I think, uh, what if he's innocent? How is it the devil is, is getting victory? How is it that people are letting the devil use them to do his work in disrupting the church in such a way? And then my mind goes to, but Lord, but by your grace, it could be me. You know, not a one of us can say we would never do something that would be that wrong. I pray that I would never. I don't expect to, by the way. But you know, we have to be real and say, help me not to be like me, but help me to be like him. Because me can mess up. And so we need to keep our eyes up on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that never sins. He never makes a mistake. And if we keep our eyes on him and follow him and press toward that goal, we have much more protection. So we see here, there's always people eager. Sometimes it's because uh, they may reject his teaching. Sometimes there, there are false accusations given because they resist and resent Bible authority and, and the pastor represents that authority that, to that individual. It may be because they resent virtue and that man possibly, hopefully, uh, uh, is an example of virtue. Uh, it may be that they're jealous of the Lord's blessing on his life. There are many reasons why some people step up and make false accusations against a man of God. It's important that God's people know the difference between rumor and gossip and the truth. We need to have wisdom when it comes to that. Men in the Bible, Joseph, Moses, David, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Paul, and even the Lord Jesus Christ himself uh, suffered from false accusations. Sometimes it was individuals that stood up to make accusations against them. Sometimes it was something that was planned as they went and found uh, men that would give false accusations toward them because their law required that two or three be uh, coming forward, as we'll see in a moment. But we have here that, that these all faced uh, accusations and uh, were false accusations. One commentator made this statement, said it is scary 
uh, excuse me, it is a sacred trust to be in the ministry. That trust is based upon a man's integrity, uh, credibility, and the consistent purity of his life. If he can be successfully attacked at that point and discredited, his ministry will be destroyed. It is imperative that his people be able to distinguish gossip and lies from reality. It's so important to have that perspective. Paul gave Timothy instructions on how to deal with elders when it came to those that were innocent, when it came to those that were guilty, and when it came to those that were seeking the position of a pastor. Let's look at these categories. First of all, those that are innocent. In verse 19, it says, against an elder, a pastor, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. All right. Uh, the word receive there means uh, to consider with your mind. So he's saying, don't consider with your mind. Don't give it any thought to an accusation against the pastor. Unless, and we'll get to the unless in just a moment. The first thing he says, reject unsubstantiated allegations of a man of God, of a pastor. Uh, turn a deaf ear to them. Unless there's two or three witnesses, two or three people that are saying the same thing that they've seen, heard, or, or experienced. Uh, then receive, then consider with your mind. Uh, don't jump to conclusion that it must be true, by the way. As I said, uh, there was two or three witnesses that were, were gained, uh, brought together against the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that he was guilty of anything. And so it does not mean immediately that we're to assume uh, the accusation is correct, uh, but it does mean that investigation uh, is warranted uh, to acquire all the facts. No pastor, and can I say this, no person, should be left to the mercy of evil accusers. Those that are just trying to defame a person's character or a person's uh, position or church. Uh, we need to be careful about that. Protect your elder, protect your pastor. And I'm not just saying that as me, because if the Lord Jesus Christ does not come back at the rapture in the next few years, there's coming a point where the Lord is going to say, my body is, is, can't keep up anymore, and there needs to be another man in this position. And when that day comes, we as a church need to be prepared to understand how that man should be protected, how that man should be chosen, as we'll see in a moment. But he will deserve just as much protection as what I would, having been here now 31 plus whatever the Lord gives beyond. And so we have that responsibility to protect the elders. Secondly, there's the rebuking of elders for those that are guilty. Verse uh, 20 and 21 says, Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without uh, preferring one before another, uh, doing nothing by partiality. So in verse 19, excuse me, in verse 20 there, it says that if any sin, if any pastor is guilty of sin and uh, violating the qualifications of being a pastor, then uh, it would be grounds to rebuke that man. What does that mean to rebuke? It means to confront and expose with the understanding or with the purpose of trying to correct. Can I say this and make sure everybody understands that there is no situation in Scripture for any individual, whether it is God chastening his children, whether it is a church disciplining a member, whether it is, in this case, a church uh, uh, confronting and rebuking a pastor that sins, none of those situations would be without the purpose of correcting the individual. God's chastisement is for that very purpose. He doesn't just chasten us, but he chastens us 
so that we would be ex we would be exercised by that to turn back to him every parent that uh, disciplines their child is not just to discipline them but it's to teach them and hopefully have them to learn not to do that again to do the right thing to correct and so with every situation it is and there it is with also with a pastor too if he has sinned, then he must be rebuked, confront to expose, and, and seek to correct. It may be, though, through the circumstances of the sin and what, what it is, it may disqualify him from continuing, but he should still be restored as a believer. And so there is the rebuke part. There's also the rebuke before all, and that all could be all pastors, all other pastors, so the pastors would say, hey, um, I better take this very seriously, but also before all other people, so that people would say, hey, I better take this very seriously. Uh, sinning uh, is something that is serious, and we need to recognize that God sees it that way and that he is going to deal with us as his children. Uh, it's been said that the, uh, the ministry is thus a two-edged sword. Those who serve faithfully are to be honored and protected, but those who sin are to be removed and publicly rebuked. Honor and accountability. Both of them are important when it comes to the ministry. Paul reminds Timothy in verse 21 that uh, this discipline should be done without respect to a person, without any prejudice against or respect for. In other words, uh, you don't do it because, you know, I never did like that pastor anyway, so let's, let's let him have it. <laughs> and you should not do it because I really love this pastor and I, I appreciate him. You know, maybe we should just let it go. The respect of person or prejudice against a person should not come into play. If there is the sin, there should be the, 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 uh, the following through. And it's important for us to realize that's not just true with pastors, but that's true with us as believers. We need to see God's seriousness when he comes to sin. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, there's a range of feeling that I have when I hear of a man that has messed up in the ministry. Um, could that be true? What have you done? Uh, not that I'm asking what specifically did you do, but what were you thinking? You know, too often it's because a person is not thinking. Or if they think at all, they think, well, nobody will ever find out. Nobody will ever know. How many times has the devil told you that? Um, the devil wants to tell us that. Um, and then, as I mentioned a while ago, the Lord comes around and says, hey, Make sure you guard yourself. Remind you to guard yourself. Don't let anything slip. Not slip up and tell. Slip up and be found. No. Don't slip and do. Don't slip and even think. Uh, we need to be careful. And then not only the protecting of elders and the, the rebuking of elders, but we have the selecting of elders. In verses 22 through 25, he starts out by saying, verse 22, lay hands suddenly on no man. I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to point your attention now to verse 23. He says in verse 23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thy often infirmities. And uh, you're thinking, what? You know, we're talking about, you know, how, what, what has this got to do with anything? Well, it's kind of a parenthetical thought here with Paul sharing with Timothy uh, on a personal note. But Timothy had committed to abstain total abstinence from, uh, uh, from wine. Um, he would not drink at all. And in his day, that was a no-no. Um, and I'll explain why. Uh, wine in, in the first century was made in a vat where the grapes were put in and the feet pressed and it made all of the mush and the, the juice and the, the pulp and everything which was gathered and put in wine skins, and they would use that as a concentrate to mix with water to make their wine. Now, a couple things to remember. 
In the first century, they did not use preservatives and they did not have refrigeration. And so what would naturally happen to the concentrate that was in these wine, uh, these uh, 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 leather skin pouches uh, that was held? It would ferment, okay? The fermentation of it would be intoxicating. So they would mix it with water and it would give flavor. It would also uh, go as an anesthetic to kill uh, some of the, the uh, disease stuff that was in the water because they didn't have pure water like we do. Uh, I remember going down to Mexico in a um, uh, missions trip. And as best as we try to drink purified water bottle water only, and you had to read about that to make sure that what was in the bottle was actually what we would call it that, um, and not eat anything washed, no vegetables washed with their water or nothing like that. The best that we can that we tried. After two weeks, I was back with Montezuma, and yeah, you don't want to be there. <laughs> Well, that's what was going on with Timothy for his stomach's sake, for his often infirmities that he would have because he was not using any of that that would kill, help kill the bacteria in the water. And so having said that, you understand that the wine of their day was different than what wine is today, both in how it was made as well as in the purpose of it and and uh, certainly it did not have alcohol like what is put in wine today uh, that is used. But we have um, a similar statement John MacArthur makes. He says, uh, Timothy had obviously committed himself to total abstinence from wine. He desired to be a model of spiritual virtue and never establish a pattern that can make someone assume liberty that would destroy them, which drinking can very easily do. There's so many that have been. Paul instructed him not to let that commitment injure his health. Water in the ancient world was impure and carried uh, a carrier of diseases such as dysentery. Paul's advice to use a little wine would help safeguard Timothy's health, health from the sickness producing effect of polluted water. It was also in keeping with the medicinal use of wine in the ancient world. You know, we don't have medicinal use for wine today. We have medicine. It's made all kinds. It's all around us. Uh, we don't have wine that is made. Jesus made water into wine. What did he make? They said it was the good stuff. <laughs> what was the good stuff? It was not even intoxicated. It was, it was the new wine that was made. It wasn't even the fermented uh, kind. Um, and so we have the differences that is there and yet we have believers today the only reason I can gather is that they want to drink and so they say well Jesus made turn water into wine it's good enough for him it's good enough for me you know You've got to overlook a whole lot of stuff to convince yourself of that. Scripture says, Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Enough said concerning what I believe God thinks about wine. Today, I do not believe that it's correct for us as believers to be involved in drinking of any sort. And um, not just occasionally, um, not just so that you don't get drunk, but because uh, I think you'll find that most lost people don't think that Christians ought to be drinking. And it's a shame that we have such a testimony about ourselves in some ways, but enough said. Parenthetical thought that Paul gave personally to Timothy. Look at verse 22 and the principle that he offers. He says, lay hands, uh, don't lay hands suddenly on anyone. 
uh, to, laying hands was to affirm their suitability for service, for ministry, and acceptance into that public ministry. We've done it before with a deacon, and where a new deacon into our church, we have the, the uh, man sat down in a chair here, and myself and other deacons would come, and we would lay their, our hands upon him, uh, and we would have prayer for him, and it was signifying that we agree with the choice of the church to, to make this man a deacon, and we're praying that God would give him uh, a good character and testimony continually uh, as he seeks to serve in that position as being a, a minister in the church. So uh, that's one way in which we see that. Uh, so he says, don't lay hands suddenly. That means, that means uh, don't make that choice quickly. Uh, whether you're choosing a deacon, whether you're choosing as we are in the, in the subject matter here of elders, you don't make a choice very quickly when it comes to choosing who's going to be your pastor. Uh, that has to be something that you spend some time and effort into. I don't even, and I use this principle, even when it comes to someone who teaches uh, a class in our church. Um, I have had people come to me before. They visit our church, and, and the next time they come, uh, they, they say, Pastor, we really like the church, and we like to join here, but it's one thing, I, I'd like to be a teacher uh, and have a class that I can teach. Uh, how soon do you think I can be set up in that position? Well, I quote them this verse right here. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Uh, don't make that choice quickly. And I encourage them, I said, it's wonderful if you, you want to be a part of our church and we'd love to have, we always need teachers and I'd uh, love to have you do that, but but I'd like for you to come and to get the feel of who we are uh, as a church family and also, more importantly, give the opportunity of our people to learn who you are and see your faithfulness and see your uh, spiritual character so that they would be more likely to do, be able to receive then the teaching uh, in the position that you would have. And they quit coming to our church. Because they don't want to wait for that process. They just want somebody to put them in that position. Why? I don't know. But I'm suspicious of it when it's that way. And rightly so, as the principle is given to us here. Lay hands suddenly. Do not put them in a position immediately uh, there. Watch them uh, and see. Uh, verses uh, 22 there. At the end it says, uh, uh, let me get to it there. Uh, neither be partaker of another man's sins. Keep thyself pure. How are we partaker of another man's sin in this case? Well, if I take a person that just comes in and I say, great, I need a teacher. Ooh, go in here and teach this one right here. And this person is not a godly character. This person has sin in their life uh, that, uh, that would come under what we're talking about right here and, and um, be obvious, then I have identified myself and condoned what's in their life in putting them in that position. That's a tough thing to do. That's why it's so important when it comes to ministry that we realize that we have a great responsibility. We have accountability to that when it comes to what we're doing for the Lord. And we need to take it very seriously. Don't be a partaker of another man's sin uh, there by exercising that. Um, but we should, if we're careful with that, then we can keep ourselves pure as a church, as it's talking about. So lay hands suddenly upon no man is the principle. Verse 24, uh, some men's sins are open uh, beforehand, going before to judgment and some men, uh, they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. What is he talking about here? Well, he talks about judgment, uh, first of all. That judgment that he's talking about is the church's assessment of a man's uh, suitability to serve. Uh, he's talking about looking into men, a man to see if, if he is qualified to be the pastor. And so the church is looking and in, 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 in trying to choose, uh, in judgment-wise, who is going to be suitable for that. And he says, when you're in that process, you can look at some men, and let's say, let's, let me pick out some men right through here. We'll use the example. 
Well, let's say we come to one man after the other, one at a time, and we look at the man and say, hey, that man, you know, there's some obvious things here on his resume. Uh, he says, hey, I think it's okay to drink. And, uh, well, that's not one that we want. To, uh, I think it's okay that, you know, and he goes down through it and makes some statements there that's obvious that's against some of the aspects of, of Scripture. Well, then it's easy to see that we don't want that one. Another man may come to, and there's nothing that we see up front. But when we start to do other investigation in their life, we find out there are some problems. So there's some men whose sins are not seen real quick and real up front and open to everybody. There's others that is seen only after you investigate. That's one of the reasons why it's important for churches to be honest when another church contacts them and says, hey, I understand that so-and-so was the pastor at your church previously, and he is now seeking to be our pastor, and we were wondering, is there anything that we should know? Was there any problem there? Was there any, uh, uh, any uh, 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 character issues or accountability issues? And the church, oh, I don't want to spread mud on anybody. So they say, oh, no, everything ain't fine. He just, he just wanted to move on yet. And they don't tell the truth. And so the next church then doesn't know and gets a man that should have known that this man has a, a past of trouble. It's important to be honest. Cautious investigation on the part of the church. How many of you members want to sit on the pulpit committee when it's needed? If the Lord Jesus Christ does not come back shortly, it will be needed. I pray that, that I can help with some of that, but I'm not going to be a pulpit committee in one, okay? Likewise, some men's good works are obvious, and other men's, they just, they're discovered their good works after you investigate more. That's the good part. The point is, don't be quick to call a pastor. Watch, listen, question, investigate, and the next word is pray. God told Samuel to go pick out the next king after Saul. God said, I'm going to tell you what household to go to. Wouldn't you like that? If, if the Lord said, I want you to pick your next pastor again, I'm going to tell you what household to go to. But Samuel got it wrong even with that knowledge that he had. He saw the oldest coming and he said, ha, man, this looks like him. I believe this is probably the one the Lord wanted, but the Lord didn't want that one. Didn't want the next one. Didn't want the next one. It was the run. It was young David. The point I'm making is this. There have been some men in the past that have come to our church, and I've looked at them and I thought, wow, that's a sharp young man. And they, they know how to lead music. They knew how to teach in children's church and had a, had a great way of, of doing those ministries. And, and I look and say, I, I wouldn't mind to have that man on staff with me. Maybe to groom that man to be the next pastor of the church. And then I'm reminded of Samuel. That's why we got to pray. Because we can look around and we can look at a person and think that we know that this should be the one for the church. But when it comes down to it, it's God's church and God knows the man that he wants there. Anything else can break the church. And we have to be careful.
Sorry. <clears throat> Don't assume just because a man is seeking a position that he's qualified for that position. Investigate. Question. Listen. Watch and pray. So in both of these messages in treating of elders, honor, respect, financially care for your pastor, protect against uh, any false accusations, but rebuke properly if necessary. And the church must do its diligence when calling a pastor. And again, I want to thank you uh, for your care of me and my family. And I want you to continue to pray for me that I would be the pastor that I should be with the responsibilities that God has given me as long as he wants me to be. And join me in prayerfully considering um, when God wants another pastor on staff here at this church and who God wants for that important position. Those things are so important. To maintain a church that is guided by the Lord Jesus Christ, we have got to keep our eyes upon him. And the only way we keep our eyes upon him is right here in this word. So I encourage you this morning as believers, as you join me in prayer and desire for the future of our church and where God leads us step by step in that process, to keep your eyes on Christ, not a man, and that we may seek to please him in every choice that we make. <clears throat> We're going to sing a song of invitation and just a chorus. You know it. We'll have the words up here for you. You've sung it many times. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. How do we do that? I said right here and if we do that it says and the things of earth will grow strangely dim the things that improperly allure us the things that distracts us the things that confuse us will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace let's stand together as we sing it and as you do May you recommit to looking to the Lord Jesus Christ in his word. that we've looked at in the last couple of weeks are not things that we would normally choose. But Father, because you have chosen to include them in your word, you've given them unto us, and it's important for us to understand them. I pray that we would not just understand facts, but Lord, in light of this, that we would exercise ourselves, and especially today, that we would recommit to the time that we spend with you in your word that our eyes could be upon the Lord Jesus Christ as we run the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.